It's a very important question. Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee or Starbucks iced coffee? Oh God. The first thing that I said out loud was raise your hand if you know for sure, like you've seen with your own two eyes, exactly what happens when we die. And everybody was like, what? Noor is an award-winning journalist, producer, and speaker who at 29 has already made a significant impact in the world of storytelling. She has founded At Your Service, a consulting and production company, and launched her investigative series, Rep, in partnership with iHeartMedia. Noor has worked with numerous partners such as Nidia, Google, and Prada to foster connection between communities. The only way that I really feel like you can tell a story in the truest form is if you know your own story and you know who you are. Why are so many people afraid to ask questions? Just yesterday, my do my daughter was shooting at me 100 questions. Exactly. One yes. after another. Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? But what's a good starting question for me to ask myself? Almost every single one of my paintings recently, I have painted the question, who are you? The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. More welcome. Thank you guys so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, the first thing I want to say is uh, I was going through some of your posts that you've created, and I was super excited when I saw that you two are a iced coffee lover in the winter time. Oh yeah, is that true? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just came iced from. Um, I took a little break in between my interviews today and went and got my coffee, my iced coffee and took a walk in the cemetery, which is like our daily routine. And even when it was like 10 degrees out, they like all of the, the cafe owner knew to have the coffee ready with yeah. ice. And I was I, not only is it iced coffee, but I drink it outside because I'm a little off yeah. my rocker sometimes, but I love it. Other, <laughs> it doesn't hit otherwise. No, I love that. I'm actually the same exact. I, the only reason I brought it up because Vlad over here makes fun of me all the time when it's the winter time. Here, I mean, I drink iced coffee. It doesn't matter yeah. what the. It doesn't hit is. for so, me. Like if so, it's hot, I go to sleep. So it's <laughs> you know, exactly. he, he he's he's always researching about people. If they drink iced coffee, if they are, that's it. He's he's so happy to interview them. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's it's the first it's the first question. Well, then my second question is going to be, it's a very important question. Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee oh, or Starbucks iced coffee? I don't want to sound like a snob at all, but neither. I like okay. I really go out of my way to it's just a thing that I really enjoy, but I try to go to like independent coffee shops. I really am like okay. a little particular about that. I but like when there is no option, then I'll go to Starbucks or Dunks and um you know, I feel inclined to say Dunkin' Donuts only because my husband is from Massachusetts and like that was like it's part of their like culture. Like Dunks is a part of their culture. Okay. And he put me on to like their iced coffee, but neither. I agree with you hundred percent on this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's because it, it. and it's just like it's just you know, I like my coffee made with love. And I really do enjoy like mm. how different people make it and um and I like That's true. Meeting. Like if somebody has the courage and uh, dedication to open up a coffee shop. I want to know everything about them. I want to know why they did it. I want to know mm. like what, why, how they fell in love with it and stuff. And so, you know, even drinking coffee for me is a storytelling medium. No, definitely. <laughs> uh, I, I love that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your career as a journalist and storyteller and speaker. It's, you've done it across all various media mm -hmm. forms. I, I'd love to take you back and say, how did you first become interested in storytelling and what drives your passion for it? This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning ed tech company serving over a million students nationwide. We understand that as parents, you want to ensure that your child receives the best education possible. 
Say hello to Argo Prep. With over 15 plus educational awards earned in just the past year, Argo Prep's platform offers your child video lessons, quizzes, drills, printable worksheets, and more. Best of all, your Argo Prep subscription comes included with four comprehensive digital workbooks that cover all four subjects math, PLA, science, and social studies. Visit ArgoPrep.com today and start your free trial. I am an incredibly curious person. If you were to ask anybody that n knew me since I was like a very, very young child, they would tell you that, that, that that's like the word that they would use to describe me. And so when I was a kid, I was just always asking questions. And I would have like the, the adults around me often say, that's like mm -hmm. a really good question. That's a really good question. Or my teachers would say mm -hmm. that. And so as a young person, I always thought, you know, I'm not really, I would think this about myself. I'm not really good at sports. I'm not really good at art, but I'm really good at asking questions. And so I really leaned into that. And I feel really lucky that, you know, I had parents who were really supportive of that and would put me into different journalism camps or writing camps or like take me to meet other journalists. And I remember when I was maybe about like 12 or 13, my dad was like, you know, there's like a name for the thing that you love to do. It's journalism. And I was like, oh, I guess that's what I want. That's what I want to do. Um, but at that time I was already like consuming, I, I just loved watching interviews and I loved how people ask questions. And I okay. remember when I was younger too, I would think like Oprah was my favorite interviewer. And I remember, I've never shared this before because I'd, I never really reflected on it until now, but I would sometimes the question that she would ask would be a question I thought in my head. And I'd be like, wait, I'm thinking the same mm. questions that Oprah's asking. Like that made me feel like I you know, I knew that being inquisitive was something that I had aspired to and something I really wanted to continue down the path of. And then I found a job that allowed me to do it. And it's been, uh, it's been a dream. And it really is like, I've done it through every medium you can really think of. But now yeah. with at your service, I realized that's why like our approach is story first, medium second, because it's like not every question or story needs to be asked or shared through television or through podcasting or through speaking. Mm. Every story has its own medium. And for rep, you know, that really needed to be an audio documentary. The people that I interviewed and the conversations okay. that I had, like they wouldn't have been the same if there were cameras because they were, some mm. of them were just so sensitive and so vulnerable that it took time for people to get into their bodies and to like really feel open and comfortable and stuff. And also it was honoring the tradition of oral history and oral storytelling. And I, I loved that we got to create what my teachers in college used to call the theater of the mind. And so we got to paint a photo mm -hmm. or an image or a scene for people to imagine, because I felt like that, that painting that the listener would create could be, even more fantastic than a visual that we could have provided. And so, yeah, we have a lot of fun picking different mediums now. Wow. That's a very powerful insight. Actually, <laughs> I would never think about mm -hmm. that. Wow. Now I thinking what I want to ask you next, but I, I, I know re just today or yesterday you posted on your, on your story that you are open to talking about death to I, anyone who yes, will listen. Yes. Well, I love this topic. I don't think we ever talked about it. <laughs> yes, yet. I'm so happy uh, that we're talking we about are, this. We are, we are, we are ready. We are ready to listen. Please educate yeah. us. Uh, I, I, I want to get into this. Uh, yeah, please uh, take it away. So, you know, I right before I came on and did the, I'm doing this podcast with you guys. I was in the cemetery and I told I shared with you like I I go to the cemet I go to our local cemetery every single day that I'm home. And it's a tradition, okay. a habit that I really cultivated while I was working on rep. It's like Adam and I will go to the cemetery, no phones allowed, no electronics allowed, just our coffee. And we take walks and that's where we have our deepest conversations about like life and wh why we're alive and things like that. And I found this like sense of peace in this space where I was like, oh, it's, this is this place, this being surrounded by death essentially is so profound and peaceful because it it's just like this constant reminder of like the truth that we all know to be true, which is that 
we are all, all of us as human beings, like our human body is going to go away one day. And, um, and so that just kind of like really started cultivating this, this, uh, connection that I had with that space in general, but, you know, rep, which started out as an investigation into media representation and storytelling really led me to this bigger question of like, who are we really? And why are we alive? And how do we, the only way that I really feel like you can uh, like tell a story in the truest form is if you know your own story and you know who you are, because that's the only way that you'll really understand the worldview that you have that might mm -hmm. permeate into the stories that you're trying to tell or the questions you're trying to ask. And then I started noticing that, you know, even me who makes a living out of asking questions started feeling fear when it came to asking certain questions and saying them out loud. And so then I started thinking about mm -hmm. like, why are we, why are so many people afraid to ask questions? And that started coming up as a thing. So after rep was done, I decided to start this thing called rep club. And instead of going on like a really big press tour and sharing the project and all this stuff, I was like, so in my feelings and my, I started having this existential like crisis almost. And I was like, wait, like what is, what is real and what is the truth? And all of, all of those big questions. And so I started rep club because I wanted to gather a concentrated group of people from around the world where I would teach the podcast and I would teach the body of work by embarking on what I call the quest of a question where everybody would start every week, everybody would start with one question and we would pull on that thread of the question and see where it took us mm -hmm. because that's what I did with rep. And so first session of rep club, I, I don't know, maybe we had like a hundred people or something in it at first. And before I even introduced myself or rep or anything like that, for some reason, I had just come from the cemetery. And the first thing that I said out loud was, raise your hand if you know for sure, like you've seen with your own two eyes, exactly what happens when we die. I don't know why that mm -hmm. was the thing that came out of my mouth, but that was what came out. And everybody was like, what on, what did we just sign up for? What's happening right now? And then I continued and cause nobody's hand went up and it was interesting because a lot of the people who were in rep club were people who are parts of different, you know, they, um, engage in different faith traditions. And so mm -hmm. when nobody's hand went up, I was like, okay, wait, this is, this is the entry point because what I realized was while people have beliefs around what happens when we die, those beliefs, every single one of them is a choice to believe it because none of us actually right. know none of us have actually seen with our own two eyes what happens when we die we don't have this guarantee of what's going to happen you can have conviction in your beliefs and that's what faith is but what i realized was okay if whoever created us didn't allow us to witness what comes after this then mm -hmm. maybe part of the reason we're on the planet is to ask questions, is to seek questions and truth and knowledge. And that does not mean that you will be getting answers to those questions. In fact, I believe that we should never ask questions with the intention of getting an answer that ends in a period. The point of asking a question, mm. in my opinion, is to expand the way that you see the world, to expand your sense of possibility. And so death which is this thing that every single one of us agree like knows that's going to happen it's like the one common truth that we have it's a common denominator is a great entry point to being like okay how can i use this fact of life to embark on the quest of a question and so i like to talk about death not because i'm trying to be morbid or i'm trying to whatever i like to talk about death because i think that it allows us to expand our world view and our sense of possibility my grandmother, I talked to her yesterday, she just had a week ago a surgery where it was a 50-50 chance that she was going to get out of the surgery alive. And thank God she's, she's here and she's alive. And, and when I was talking to her yesterday, she had this completely new world view having almost died and having suffered some of the most excruciating, the most excruciating pain she had ever gone through last week. 
And we had the most beautiful conversation about death and how she was telling me, you know, when they brought me into the operating room, I felt, I felt this extreme sense of peace. I knew, you know, if this is my time Mm. to go, I accept it. I feel like I felt so close to God. And, and then she, you know, she came out of this and now she has all of these big, beautiful questions that she feels like she wants to ask. And it was this incredible sense of possibility of renewal. So I really feel like if you want to experience life and the questions that life has to offer, then we have to be able to then then move to the like thoughts of death. And it's funny because after my conversation with my grandmother, I called my parents and they were asking about it. And I was telling my dad, I always tell my dad, he's like, what did you guys talk about? And I say, I, we talked about death. And he's like, why do you always talk about that? That when we think about mm-hmm. death too much, we're not going to be able to move forward. I was like, no, on the contrary. I actually think that if we talk about death more, that we live fuller lives. And so my fascination with death and wanting to talk about it isn't to think about what happens when we die. It's to think about how I want to live today. Mm. So what, 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 so here, let me, let me ask this. What kind of questions should we be asking? Let's say, you know, we, we want to engage in this topic. What, what's, I don't know, one of the, what's, uh, what's a good starting question for me to ask myself, because uh, I, I am like the other nine, I don't know, whatever the percent it is. I don't want to make up a percent, but I'm part of the majority where, when I think about that, it's, it's scary. I get yeah, nervous. Totally. I, I, you know, I don't, I just shut it off. I shut it off and we're, we're right back to, we're, we're right back to everything else and our problems. Yeah. What, what is a first good question maybe that I, mm. you know, I, I know it's a very open-ended, but what's, what's a good question for me to start no, off No, I'll with? give you more than a first question because I have been thinking, as I've been thinking about it, I actually just posted right now before we got on this, um, these questions I've been painting, I've been painting a lot and painting has helped me ask questions. Um, I started painting like a lot while I was working on rep when I couldn't figure out what I was trying to say or what I wanted to, to ask. And the questions would kind of come out through the paintbrush because there was this level of concentration and all of my questions, I'm literally looking at my paintings right now. Almost every single one of my paintings recently, I have painted the question, who are you? And I had this breakthrough a couple Mm -hmm. of days ago where I was telling Adam, I think we just need to go back to the basics. When you first, not, you don't even learn this in journalism. So you learn this in elementary school, the who, what, when, where, why, and how those are like the basic questions that you learn about how to tell a story or how to investigate a story. But I'd like to turn all of those questions inward. So I started asking the questions, Mm -hmm. who are you? what are you? Why are you? Where are you? When are you? And how are you? And Mm. this kind of becomes a little philosophical, but I can like elaborate a little bit more too. When you ask the question, who are you? All of these questions are, are contextual with like this moment in time. And that's why they're really good questions to revisit. So my answers today to these questions mm-hmm. are going to be different than tomorrow. So if I'm asking this question, who are right. you? You're, get, you're using the context of who are you in this moment today? How do you identify? How do you want to describe yourself? What do you feel like is like the most um, truthful version of yourself right now? What are you? Is also an amazing question. We, say, we always ask people, what do you do? What do you do? We have people define themselves by like their jobs. And it's like, I am yeah. a painter. I am a writer. I'm in a... But like, are those, are you, when you answer those questions about what are you, are you answering it based on like a job that you do, a name that you were given or your actual essence as a soul? Who, uh, when, when are you? I love this one because when are you is really great because it acknowledges that so many of us actually live in the past or so many of us live in the anxiety of the future. And the goal is to be here now, to be present. So when I ask myself, when are you, I'm actually engaging with like, am I here in my body right now? Or am I in my head in a, in a distant memory of the past or an anxiety of a future that doesn't exist right now? Cause now is all we have. Why are you gives context to the, who are you? And like the filling in the blank of the story of, you know, of, of your ancestors and the, your lineage and your surroundings and understanding all of that. And how are you? How are you is perfect yeah. because like that's how I always ask, how is your heart doing? And I feel like that's a, that gets into the essence of everything because it's like you're, for me, the heart is like where 
our deepest like form of consciousness exists. And so mm. checking in with your state of your heart is also, and so when you ask all of those questions and you, it kind of allows you to like, whoop, it's like, okay, this is Noor today. This is this person that in mm. my body today. And it's those questions are a great starting point for me because then you're filling in the context of what is real versus trying to control things that are unknown. Um, if that's too much for someone or too philosophical, then I think the, an amazing entry question that I always suggest to people is what is your relationship with your name? What does your name mean? Why were you given mm -hmm. this name? And how do you engage with the relationship with your name? I think a name is also a really great place to start. But wherever you're starting, I always encourage it to be from like your insides. Don't don't try to focus on everything that's happening here because the whole goal is to come back inward. Because once you do that, once you create that change or that acknowledgement, that's how the world around you changes because your worldview changes. We want the world to change, then you have to not – just only change yourself, but you have to change the way that you see the world because then the world changes because it's, it's about how you show up and how you see it. And thank you so much for elaborating because I think that's very helpful, especially it's helpful for me, but also to all the listeners out there as well. Um, but do you ask these questions uh, yourself or you are in discussion with somebody? Because oftentimes if you just by yourself sitting and I'm speaking about the majority of people who are in depression, let's say, they're sitting and asking, who am I? And they cannot find the answer and they are going to go even more into depression that they are nobody, you know, or you have to right. find somebody to speak about it. At least. That's a, that's a really interesting perspective. Um, but what's very important with what you just said is you do not ask the question hoping to have an answer, even when you're asking yourself questions mm -hmm. like because answers with periods are just a form of control. Like, I, it's funny, I was thinking, I said this yesterday to Adam, I was like, I, I'm looking at a mountain right now and, and, and trees and stuff. And I was like, isn't it so wild that this image before me is simply what my eyes are, have the capability of seeing, but there's so much that's happening that I can't see, that my eyes don't have the capability to see. And to me, so if you were to say, what color is that tree? And I would say green, that's not a period. You, because I don't actually like that's what my eyes are seeing right now, but I don't know all of the colors that are actually present here. And so it's it's also acknowledging like our own limitation of what it means to be in a human body. But the thing about and, and it's interesting that you brought it up in terms of like depression and this existential question of like, who am I? The goal isn't to know who you everything about you. It's to explore who you are. It's to welcome different parts of you that come to the surface. But when we try to control those answers and we're like, I need to know exactly who I am and why I am and how I am and all of these things, like for what and for who? Because the answers that you that you do end up with today are, are not going to be the same tomorrow and aren't the same as yesterday. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying it's a it's more of the habit of getting into this this habit of asking questions rather than trying to figure something out. And that's where, that's like the key is like, and it's frustrating too, because when you're consuming stories and when you're consuming media, there's so much abso absolutism and it's not just media. It's also in religion. It's also in education systems. There is this, like, this is a fact. What is a fact? Mm -hmm. Like even me saying the sky is blue is not really a fact. And I'm just, you know, and so it's, so you have to question again, everything. I, yes, but don't, but we don't have to also get overwhelmed by that. Obviously can get really overwhelming, mm. but questioning everything is simply saying, I choose to expand. I choose to be curious. I mm. choose to wonder. And it, being in a state of wonder, because when you are being in a state of wonder allows you to no longer see like the world revolve around you, but instead you just simply being a witness to the world around you. And so then everything is just from this place of curiosity. Like I've been thinking a lot about this principle of like nothing is personal. Even when somebody says you're mm -hmm. this and you're that and I hate whatever and, and they're pointing at you and they're yelling in your face. Now, because of the state of wonder, I'm like, ah, oh, okay. 
I'm observing. I'm mm-hmm. like, that's not actually about yeah. me. That's just a reflection of your insides. And so what you're really telling me is how you're feeling about yourself these days. And once you kind of remove like the sense of self out of the equation, the state of wondering becomes so much more expansive and, and beautiful and hopeful because then it's just like, you don't have to figure everything out, but you can just witness things. And that's actually a radical act in itself because then you're like not conforming and putting yourself into the system that expects you to be a robot who's addicted to technology Mm -hmm. and doesn't know how to have human connection. It's really hard to, you know, deeply connect with people when you're just trying to figure them out instead of just be curious about them. You know what Mm -hmm. all this reminds me? I mean, in terms of, in terms of not uh, expecting to get the answers and always ask uh, questions, kids, just yesterday, exactly. my, do- my yes. daughter was yes. shooting at me 100 questions, one after another. Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? And I wasn't even capable of answering some of the questions in, in the first place. And she wasn't expecting to answer me. She just wanted to ask. She was just asking, asking, yes. asking. And then when you go to school, when you go here, there, and a lot of times parents all, also, they're shishing at them, stop asking me this question, this and that. And oh. this is where we as adults... Wow. Uh, stop questioning things and stop asking questions. Bingo. Yeah. Kids are, I, whenever my 12 year old brother asks questions, I record them and I save them. And I, I'm so protective of his curiosity because if you want to know what good questions to ask, go listen to children. Because it's funny because the interview that mm. I just did before this, um, the person I was interviewing was saying how like, you know, people are oftentimes like, don't like try to dumb down questions or answers for children. They think that their brains are not able to comprehend something so complex. But what the person was saying was that, but kids are, they are literally developing a worldview. So their brain is in the perfect place. Their mind and their heart is in a perfect place to have questions be what leads them to filling in the worldview. Children have the most, I I really believe like they have all the answers. And then we just, from our own sense of insecurity and this fear of saying, I don't know to kids. Like, I I feel like a lot of times adults feel Mm -hmm. like they have to have answers for them. And it's just like the saying, saying, I don't know is more powerful than giving them an answer because it's saying that it's okay not to know and it's still important to ask. So I I love listening to the questions that children have. It's so, so, so important to like foster that sense of curiosity. And I think that what we end up doing as adults is just like we end up getting stuck in the solution always ends up being like going back to our kids' selves and like our curious child wonder and brain so that we can – let go of such certainty about everything that we think we know yeah and one out of ten times when i'm saying i don't know my daughter will tell oh you don't know let me tell you the story and she's just telling me the answer (laughs) children are brilliant 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 yeah so inspiring wow (laughs) vlad i'll pass it over to you to ask your question okay um now i want to speak about let me see about the rap so your investigative series uh, recently nominated for a Webby Award as the best limited series. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And um, I want to know everyone that e- examines the stories we tell and how they affect us all. So what inspired you to create this series and what do you hope your audience take away from it? So rep and most of my investigations come from this place of pain usually of there is something that is paining me and I feel like I need to figure out how, what to do about it. And for rep, it was specifically misrepresentation of Muslims and Arabs in this case, that was really paining me. And I started asking and wondering because I had been thinking about this question a lot. Another good question that I think about is what is the role I am playing in this problem? And I had never really thought about like, what is the role that I am playing in my own misrepresentation? 
And instead of always just like pointing fingers at everybody else, which like, you know, especially when it comes to media and misrepresentation, there is so many problems. But the only thing I'm going to be able to change is my own approach. And so I wanted to pull on this question and figure out what I could actually do about it. And it became that became the entry question, but it became this very profound and revelatory uh, series of actually investigating our relationship with stories, truth, objectivity, and representation. And it was really profound in that, like, I realized, and similar to why Rep Club was so important, everybody has their own rep journey. Because really what it means is that rep, remi- it was a reminder that the only person that you can actually represent is yourself. You cannot, nobody can actually represent a group or an entire like community or whatever it is. But oftentimes mm-hmm. the stories reduce people to that. And they're like, you know what? This is the person who rep, especially when you're often tokenized, which like me as a Muslim woman, have I've been tokenized like most of my career. So there was always this pressure that like I represent something, but I, but I am a very individual person with my own stories, with my own experiences, with my own questions. It's not fair to ever put that onto another person. And so then you end up, this is how generalizations are made. Stereotypes are made. um, These like very limited things. And what I began to uncover is that this wasn't just hurting the stories and the way that people were receiving the stories. It was hurting the people the stories were about. And so I had to start, with my own self and my own story and my own family and be like, okay, let's start at home. So what are some of the stories that I need to face that have been misrepresented and how that's impacted our family? And so of course, in the first episode, I start with a story of my own family experiencing an American bombing, killing our five of our family members. And I took this political uh, act of tragedy that happened in 1986 And I tied it to a huge pop culture moment that happened right before that also misrepresented Libyans in the opening scene of Back to the Future. And then I found footage of people's public opinion that was and how they were talking about it. And I started finding like finding these patterns in the stories that we were telling and how if we use storytelling tools to break down why certain things happen around us and how those stories define us, then we are able to better represent ourselves as individuals. And if we know how to represent ourselves as individuals, then when I see another person or I see another, when I see another person, I see another story, an individual story that only represents them because then I'm like, Oh wait, I know how unique my story is and how specific it is to me that I would never Mm. generalize another person in my entire career. I've always asked this question. How is the way that I tell this story going to impact the person or community that I'm talking about? And rep basically filled in the context of why I was actually asked. I I just knew to ask this question because I knew that stories could be harmful if we didn't consider that. But now I'm realizing, oh, it's because of what I call revolutionary representation and the importance of revolutionary representation, which takes the word revolutionary in the most literal sense, which is a revolution is a full turn or a circle or it's ongoing infinite circle, right? And so in order to engage in revolutionary representation, when we tell stories or when we ask questions, we must acknowledge that this is just a documentation of a moment in time, but this person is always evolving. So a story that I told about myself last week or last year is not going to be the same today because I'm not the same person I was. And so if we start to, if we start to tell stories from that lens of like, constant evolution then we are forced to ask more questions than put periods at the end of things because then Mm. you the story is open-ended then the story is like and this is constantly evolving and so that's where I wanted to get to and that's why I think that rep has kind of led me to asking these really massive questions about life and existence now because I'm just like oh there's so much more possibility than just the stories that I thought were true I want to transition and speak about one particular episode, number 10, if you remember. 
It was yes. public opinion, politics, pop culture, and public opinion. So you discuss the impact of public opinion on the lives of Palestinian people. So how do you think having prominent figure like Bella Hadid on your podcast can contribute to a broader understanding of these issues among your audience? Mm. So it's funny because neither Bella nor I knew that this was going to happen. But when it did happen, we knew that there was a responsibility to share it. And she, in so many ways, represents the impact of public opinion. You know, she's a very high-profile figure who is constantly scrutinized for so many different things and yet still chooses to use her platform to speak on a truth that is related to her own personal story. And she has also witnessed the world's reaction around that. And it was very, um, I felt like an important story to add to this like big question of public opinion around the Palestinian people because it made us face up close, like why are, why are people so afraid to talk about another people? Like what, how did we get to a place where it was scary to talk about humanity? And that requires a lot of dehumanization of a people. And so we wanted to kind of zo zoom into her story and then zoom out to like the power structures that were at play. And I think that, you know, the story was incredibly impactful. It was the first time she had ever shared those things in a public way. And it, it really made, it really amplified this question of like, Every, of people, including myself, asking, why do I, why would I ever feel afraid to talk about this? And mm. I think that it can't, comes down to humanity and it comes down to people. And when we dehumanize a people, we make it seem like uh, the subject matter or this quote unquote conflict is taboo. But it's, but a people cannot be taboo. A people is like, these are our brothers and sisters. These are people who like, Th right. This is humanity. And so we, we cannot be afraid to talk about humanity. And I think that that is why asking questions is such a radical thing because it's just like once you face that fact, you kind of all of the fears and the scary things around kind of dissipate. And it's just like what you're left with is what kind of person are you going to be? And are you going to be one that sees a, a human, a, a group of people as a conflict or as humanity that is – um, that is that has their own culture and their own struggle and their own history who we are responsible for. And um, yeah, I mean, that story is still what I'm reflecting on till now because there was just so many, like you can go all of the personal routes, but it also is filled with such rich context of how we got here. And so I felt like it was, and it was also really important for me to do this story because, you know, when we first started doing rep, I remember telling Adam, I can't do a series investigating media representation without talking about Palestinian people because this was like the prime example of like that consistently in every job and everywhere that I went that people would be like, no, 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 you can't talk about this. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, wait, since, but like, but why? But I had never really asked myself that in that way. So that episode really allowed me to ask it and interrogate my own behavior but also fill in the context of how we got here. Before, be, be, before wow. I pass you to Anayat, I want to add one more thing. I think one of the answers why people not discussing it and why they fail to discuss it, because everybody um, have a fear of being judged. So as soon as you ask some oh. question, like, like you're saying, nobody's speaking about people of Palestinian, because everybody fear that their opinion going to be not matching with yours or yours with them. And, you know, all this conflict going to be arise, will, will arise right away. So I think everybody is just uh, scared of being judged. Yeah. And isn't that funny, though, that it comes down to being scared of being judged. And that's part of why people are afraid to ask questions to begin with, because they're afraid to be judged. And this is why we need to ask them. And that's why at the end of that episode, yeah. I literally say, ask the questions that you're afraid to ask. 
because they deserve mm. to be asked out loud. That means the more scared you are to ask a question, the more important it means that you need to ask it because yeah. we should never be afraid of asking something out loud that may expand our worldview or disrupt our worldview. And that's really what it is. Is in that, And, you know, we are in a place in a country where we tech, we have freedom of speech and freedom of press, however it may show up. So it's just like, what are you going to do with that freedom? Because not everywhere in the world can you ask this and can you demand uh, more thinking around it or more expansion around it. And so I, I've been thinking a lot about that and how I do feel the sense of responsibility that we need to, we need to lean into that and demand more of each other when it comes to asking questions out loud. Noor, uh, you are an inspiration to many people, uh, many people. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a Muslim household as well. And I, 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 I love your journey that we, we didn't get into your journey in childhood, but I do want to talk a little bit about this because um, I, want, I kind of want to, I, there's a lot of people in our community, and, may, and maybe it's true for other communities as well. I can only speak for our community. And in fact, I'm not even going to speak for all Muslim people. I'm just going to speak for uh, uh, specifically within like the Daisy community over here is especially growing up as, as children, we were extremely, uh, what are the right words I'm looking for? We wanted to be anything but Daisy. We wanted to be anything but Muslim. Yeah, you know? totally. Well, we can go into school. We, you know, we, we wanted to be American. We wanted to be that. Uh, my, my question is, do you have any advice for the younger generation over here? I would say maybe the younger uh, generation that are Muslim, maybe live, uh, just, just in general about maybe any tips to embrace uh, embrace their culture or religion if they're struggling with that because I've only embraced it. I've only embra I've I got a I I try to escape uh, and then I found myself really getting back into my culture and appreciating everything about it uh, when I when I was older. But for you, I, I, that that happened earlier than that that happened earlier than I experienced it. But do you have any any advice for that? Well, I don't How know do we if get I experienced for our it culture? earlier. I mean, I think that that was just it's it's like an ongoing journey. I think the advice that I would have is to ask questions about it, is to ask questions about your faith and to ask questions about your culture and to document the stories of like your family. Like I really feel like that's a huge part of it is understanding who you are and why you are. And in order to mm. um, because otherwise you're just going to be defining yourself by the way that the stories that are adjacent to you are portrayed. And those aren't always those aren't necessarily positive or um, they're not yours because your story is your story. And so I think it's a little bit different now. There's so much more representation and there's so many th like, you know, people um, are are. I could have never in my entire life imagined that on television I was going to watch a show like Rami or, mm. or a movie like Head or any of that stuff. And so um, I think that, you know, there's so much, so many more stories out there. And I hope that yeah. when people engage with those stories, they consider, oh, I have a story too. Because that's really what it is. It's like figuring out that you have a story that is uniquely your own too. And also like, I just find it so boring to like, want to be somebody else like I know in my right. life right now as hard as things are I would never want to be anybody other than myself and it's not mm. and it took a lot uh, to well it didn't it took a lot of asking questions to get there and I'm just like you know what things don't have to be easy and I can have these specific insecurities but instead of just letting them define me how do I want to define myself and I also think that it's really important that people learn that it's okay to ask questions about your culture and about your faith and about your heritage and stuff and this uh this professor that I interviewed on the podcast he studied Quranic education in West Africa and specifically Senegal and he did his thesis on that and he was asking um all of these scholars how do you raise a Muslim child and he said the okay. answer that they gave him, all, like a lot of them, is there's no such thing as a Muslim child, that there's only the child of a Muslim and that mm. that children themselves have to go on their own faith journey. Like we don't own our kids. 
they're their own person right. who are going on their own journey. And so it's also on us to create a space for them. Like, and, and he had said, like, our, the, the job of the parent is to be a role model and to be an example of what a Muslim is. But the, the person, the kid themselves has to go on that journey. And so I think it's also on us to create the space for young people to explore who they are without imposing our beliefs onto them. And I know that that might be a controversial thing for people to hear, but it shouldn't be because that's what life is about. Life is literally about asking questions about who am I and why am I alive? And if you're just going to impose who you are as a flawed being who has their own story onto your kids, then eventually they're going to get to a place where they're going to have to figure it out for themselves, but they're going to have to do a lot of unlearning and a lot of healing to get there. So instead just give them the space yeah. to do that and let, and be a guide. But, um, and so that's more advice for like the parents around, but for the kid themselves, like don't be afraid to ask questions, even when it makes people uncomfortable, the scariest questions that you have in your mind deserve to be written down. Wow, that is so powerful. And I, I, I love that. I'm going to literally take this clip and send it to my mom. <laughs> uh, seriously. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Uh, even, e e even though she'll probably beat me up for it because you said it's such a controversial take, but it is the right, it is, that is, that is But right. what's the controversial take is 1, that like percent. we want people to ask, it's not, it's the, the controversial take is that we're afraid to ask questions. But and again, so it, it, it all comes to judgment. To ask it all comes to judgment totally. because because I think your mom, if you're going to be asking some controversial questions, she's going to be afraid of what everybody else will think about you and your family. So it's, but it's, can it's I also very tell you about judgment? Any judgment made on someone is a judgment on oneself. So you can make judgments all you want, but every single judgment that you make is actually a judgment about yourself. And so when people make judgments now, I'm just like, oh, I hope that you get a chance to reflect on like what that means to you. Because a judgment that's made about me, which has happened my entire life, that that isn't actually about me. The, you, especially when the people who are making the judgments don't necessarily know me. So, and it's also like, why are we wasting our time thinking about what other people think? Like, that's such a waste of time. It's like, it's just not how I want to use my life. So, I mean, hey, some people, this is like deeply rooted in their culture and honor and all this stuff. But yeah. you got to eventually ask yourself, if everyone is obsessed with honor and reputation and all these things, then like, isn't it time to just like call a truce and be like, guys, like, what is this? Who are we performing for? What is this show? Just stop. Just be yourself. And like, and I will love you exactly as you are, because I know that I'm not. I don't own you and I'm not responsible for your journey. I keep asking, one of the questions I'm asking myself these days is, are we supporting people and giving them the space to explore who they are or are we trying to control them? Mm. And if like, and I need to ask myself that because I, I, I really want to always support creating spaces for people to ask questions about who they are. And I feel like that's a really big responsibility and especially because you guys are in education. I think that that's the biggest responsibility is how are our education spaces of education supporting people and giving them the space to ask those questions about who they really are. Wow. Uh, this, that is extremely powerful. And yeah, it, it's, it's, I think the world would be a much, we would be in a much better place if we were actually allowed to ask more questions. Growing up, I was never allowed to ask any questions about religion or culture. It, it was just what it is. And, and so, you know, a lot of problems arise from there. And again, I apologize to both Noor and Vlad because my, the, the audio, uh, I, I'm missing parts of the conversation. So if sometimes I sound like I'm saying something ridiculous, I apologize. No, you're uh, fine. I may be taking something. You are not being judged in there. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the very least, I'm not being judged. Thank, thank you very much. This has this 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 is a frustrating uh, issue. I, you're I, actually I like to see, perfectly clear and, I, and consistent to us. So. I, well, I'm I'm glad because on my end, <laughs> I sometimes I can't see either of you, or sometimes I can't hear. It's just it's it's but it, it's it's all it's all good. So thank you for thank you for your patience. Uh, let's see over here. Okay, uh, so uh, Noor, I want to ask you uh, one last question, I suppose, before 
uh, and thank you so much for for spending the time with us. This has been such an important conversation, and more importantly for me, because I, uh, it's this is a this is an important conversation for our community as well, and that that's that's my goal here. Uh, but Noor, one of the last questions I'd like to ask you is: Who has been the most uh, strongest or uh, in, inspiring person in your life, and what lessons have you learned from them? I'd say definitely my mom, and that's because she has really epitomized this like concept of giving space to me to asking these questions and um is like really respectful of the journey that I'm on and that I continue to be on and the lessons that I've learned from her most recently is that the importance of remaining light and joyful in this process I think that for me I you know I've just been asking these very daunting questions that can like put me like make me feel really low sometimes and really sad and yeah. then sometimes I'll talk to her and she'll just laugh and she'll be like but why just like it who cares it's little. and she's so light about it and yeah. I'm like oh so I've been thinking a lot about how like lightness and joy is actually a radical mm -hmm. act and how when you are embracing really huge questions to remain light and joyful in the process of exploring those questions is such a transformative it gives you the experience that you really deserve and need um, but you need the space to be able to do that and so um yeah. i feel very grateful that th that i have that space with her wow i love that again this has been a very powerful conversation uh, at least for me, because I can kind of relate to. I just want to ch shove some specific clips that we've talked about <laughs> and just like drop it off to every Daisy mom's uh, uh, household over here uh, and dads. I can't let me not forget about the dads. But uh, <laughs> um, Noor, thank you so much. Do you uh, please can you share just very quickly where uh, individuals or any viewers interested? Where can they find yeah. you? Is it Instagram? Is it your website? Please uh, just let, let us know yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, so Instagram is at Noor, N-O-O-R, or at A-Y-S, which is at your service, our storytelling company. You can listen to Rep, R-E-P, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And we have a season of Podcast Noor, which is my storytelling series that comes out soon. Um, and... Yeah, I would say that those are probably the best things. You can go on our website. It's just ays.media um, and check out the work that we're up to. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Of course. Thank you.